We have one single verse again today. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. It says this, Hear now the word of the Lord. You shall not commit adultery. This is God's word, amen? May he add a rich blessing to its reading and to its receiving by faith. You can have a seat. Church, join me in a word of prayer as we continue in our worship through the word preached and the word received. Let's pray. Um, Father, we thank you this morning for your word, this Lord's Day. Lord Jesus, please, as a good shepherd, feed uh, your flock today. Holy Spirit, please teach us, uh, please correct us, please rebuke us in our sin. Please train us in righteousness. We pray all this for your glory. You are our one, only, holy God. For your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, another heavy one today. So church, as we consider the seventh commandment more carefully, we need to remember that as we approach, we must come humbly. We need to adopt the posture of humility as we deal with these issues and these topics and really um, all of these sensitive issues. Uh, we live in a culture of lust without boundaries. I think that describes our culture well. There's a, a plague when it comes to sexual sin, sin relating to sex. And it's not only struck society at large, but actually the church as well. It, it's hit us hard. There's not a man here that does not struggle with sin related to the seventh commandment. There's not a woman here that is exempt from the seventh commandment either. It's so all the more, you and I must come to this, this law and really every single law, but this law especially with a humble awareness of our, our, my sinfulness. Uh, the father of the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, remember I mentioned the, the Reformation Day, October 31st. He coined this helpful phrase. It's in Latin, and I'll say the Latin and I'll give you the English, but it's this, simul justus et peccator, at once righteous and sinner. At once, righteous and sinner. And church, this is how Christians should understand our current state. This is how we should see ourselves. In and of myself, I'm a sinner. And yet, simultaneously, at once, I'm counted righteous before God by the gift of God in Christ Jesus alone. You see how that shifts how we see ourselves? You see how that shifts the way that we look at others and view others? It allows us at the same time to embrace and to proclaim the whole truth boldly, full-throated. And at the very same time, it reminds us that we should never, never speak condescendingly to anybody. Again, because we know that we are more flawed, more wicked than we ever dared to imagine. And yet, at the same time, in Christ, I am more loved and accepted than I ever dared to hope. That's good news. So church, as we proceed, let's proceed in this study, especially in the seventh commandment, by the, by the grace of God. Keeping our hearts humble, confessing our own sin. We've been camping out in Exodus 20 where God came down in glory. Uh, he's making his covenant with his people Israel uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai. And he's giving them these ten commandments. These were covenant laws. They, they showed the people how to live as the people of God, as his redeemed people. Um, it showed them how to love God, right? We, we talked about the way that the first four commandments, they're, they're vertical 
they, they tell us how to love God, and then they also show us how to love one another. Remember we said that the, the last six of the ten are horizontal commandments, so vertical and horizontal. And you remember that commandment six, it, it spoke to honoring life. It was thou shalt murder, but on the, on the positive, it's honor life. Life is a reflection of, of honoring the God who created life, the author of life, the one who created people in his own image. And when we honor them, we honor God as well. Well, similar things happening here as we consider the seventh commandment. If you know the language of scripture and, and covenant, oftentimes uh, the idea of covenant plays into not only our relationship with God, but our relationship with one another. So in the seventh commandment, faithfulness to God's covenant, here's what you need to know, is reflected paralleled, expressed by faithfulness to the marriage covenant. Those things work in parallel. In other words, obeying this commandment is just another way that God's people live as he designed and reflect his own goodness, his own glory in this world. So here's the point, and this should be in your notes, and I wanted to get this right. Church, our purity, especially in marriage, and by extension, in all our relationships is meant to reflect the beauty and glory of the moral purity of the only holy God himself. Okay, you should look at your notes or, or raise your hand if you need a copy of the notes. I'll have uh, phrases like that, important ones, written out for you, and also some definitions, and we will be referencing other scripture verses today, and those will be in the notes as well. So I've titled this message, Against Adultery, But For Purity. Right, remember, we said there's a negative and a positive. Um, so against adultery for purity, I have three headings today. The first is what the seventh commandment says. Second, what Jesus says about the seventh commandment. And then third, what God calls us to do about it. Okay, I'll say that again. What the seventh commandment says against adultery in particular. What Jesus says about the seventh commandment. You know, against, here's the word, uh, here's the phrase, heart adultery. And third, what God calls us to do about it, to pursue purity positively, okay? My prayer is that today God uh, will humble us in our sin, that God will center us again in Jesus and in his grace, that God would equip us and empower us to shine the light. You think about the image of light, it's, it's pure, it's holy. May he use today to help us shine that pure light undivided light of devotion to him, to our only holy God. Okay, number one, first heading, what the seventh commandment says. Look again at Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, and I'm just going to pick through it real slow. First word, you. <laughs> you. Yes, you, but in context, don't forget who is speaking and to whom. Okay, and this is the Lord, this is Yahweh. And he's speaking to Israel, his, his covenant people, you, my covenant people, those I just redeemed from Israel. Remember that? That's in that context. Don't forget what God did with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. You know, in, in, in Egypt, they were just the property of Pharaoh. They were used and abused, and then Yahweh rescues them, makes them his own special people, restores them as worshipers of the one true and holy God. He belongs to they belong to him, and he belongs to them. That's why the Bible uses the idea of jealousy when it comes to God, because of who is speaking and who he's speaking to. Those who belong to him. The Bible says God is good jealous. He's good jealous. James 4, 5, this should be in your notes, explains, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Yearns jealously. God is rightly possessive of his covenant people. That's the you in this commandment. Let's not forget that. Think about a marriage covenant for a second. Okay, who would be fine uh, with vows that go something like this? I, I pledge myself fully to you except on the occasion and opportunity that I can give myself to another more attractive, another more rich, or just an overall better deal than you. No, right? And, and here's the point. God rescued 
Israel, made them his own covenant people. They rightly belong to him. He's rightly jealous for them. Okay, that's the first word. Second word, you. Next word, shall, or phrase, two words, shall not. Notice how absolute that is. Must not, may never. Remember all these, um, many of these commandments start with that negative, right? Shall not, must not, absolutely not. You may never. Doesn't this point to the standard of a holy God, the moral purity, the moral holiness of God? Um, we read this in our in scripture reading on the law. 1 Peter 1.16 is actually citing uh, Leviticus 11.44. It is written, you shall be holy for... I am holy. The Lord himself is pure, holy. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but when it comes to sexual sin and the people of God, God says in Ephesians 5, 3, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. The, the NIV puts it, not even a hint. I mean, you wouldn't take a cup of water and drink it if it had even a drop of raw sewage in it, right? Drop. No, you wouldn't do that. That'd be gross. That'd be toxic. You might die. Well, God's not pleased with even a drop of sexual sin in our lives. Not even a hint. Continuing on, you shall not, in the last two words, commit adultery. Now, we'll go into this in more depth later, but on its face, this is just strictly talking about sexual relations or behavior with another person's spouse. That plain, that clear. But as we're going to see more broadly, it refers to sexual relation or behavior with anyone who is not your spouse. And again, the logic is clear here. In, in this commandment, following, you know, you shall not murder, is that God loves life, right? He, he made it in his image. And that commandment, um, this commandment now relates to how he's going to propagate that life, continue it. Church, God, from the very beginning, I mean, that's why he made marriage. He created it from the beginning so that he would have a people, a people for his glory. He, he designed humans in his image, and bless them with being fruitful and filling the earth. So when you think about it, this commandment and marriage was appointed by God for the flourishing of his people and his purposes. And that's why he protects marriage with this, with this strong commandment. By the way, marriage is pre-political, right? We just finished the election thing. And, and yeah, governments have dealings with marriage, but the Bible says it's pre-political. It's a pre-political institution. It's from creation. It was invented by God, not man. And yes, governments do very well to get on board, to protect marriage, but we won't be a state, we won't be a polis for very long if we don't do that. More on that a little later. Okay, so that's the, the commandment itself and, and what it says. The commandment prohibits marital unfaithfulness, for God's covenant people. But not just them. It protects marriage as God designed it. And, and church, not only is this one of the most referenced commandments in the Old Testament, you know, second only to thou shalt not commit idolatry, but it's the most referenced commandment in the New Testament. God the Son, when He came in the flesh, right, Christmas time, He had a lot to say about this commandment for us, for his church. So he who has ears, let him hear. Here we go, number two. What Jesus says about the seventh commandment. Um, look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 30. This should be on the screen there. Or you can turn in your copy of God's word to Matthew 5, verses 27 to 30. And this is what it says. You have heard that it was said... This is Jesus in his famous Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone 
who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is Jesus' words. If your eye, or I'm sorry, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Okay. Sounds serious. Let's take a look. First, when Jesus said, uh, but I say to you, okay, he's, he's not trying to contradict what the commandment says. Jesus never does that. Instead, as God, right, in the flesh, he came to fulfill the law, to proclaim it, to recover and explain the fullness of the law, down to the heart. Not the mere outward, but the fullness of the law. In fact, he's speaking to Pharisees, right? And he, and, and he says to these Pharisees who prided themselves in following the commandments to the letter, he's telling them, you know, you have not gone far or deep enough because you lost the true heart. I'm here to bring you back. All right, so second, by what Jesus said, he, he seems to mean, and I said something similar last week, that you can be 100% adultery-free and yet still be in danger of the fires of hell. What is that? Let's take a look more closely at the words here. The Greek word, uh, it's one word, but translates into two in English, lustful intent, that Jesus kind of focuses us on. Uh, it means to set one's heart upon something, to long for, to desire what is forbidden. Okay, that's the idea of lust. Lust is this disordered, distorted, self-serving desire. And so in the context of this commandment, it's directed towards someone who is not your spouse. That's what this is really about. Jesus was saying to look with lustful intent upon another is heart adultery. Adultery of the heart. It's a violation of the heart of the seventh commandment. Later in um, Mark 7, verses 20 to 23, Jesus said what comes out of a person, running with this idea, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, Wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Um, the Greek word that he used for sexual immorality covers broadly all, okay, all kinds of sexual immorality, every disordered sexual desire and adultery is included in that specific uh, list of evils as well. Notice that. This is Jesus. Okay, but did you catch it? Jesus made it very clear. This proceeds from where? From within. From out of the heart of man. All these evil things come from within. They defile a person. It's not just a behavior issue. Do you, do you see what Jesus is saying? It's a heart issue. Our hearts need to change. We need to change. Uh, later, the Apostle Paul wrote a similar list, kind of like Jesus does here. One wonders if he's just kind of reflecting that, just emanating that. And in this list, he said that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see the seriousness of that? These evils disqualify you from the kingdom. Additionally, the, uh, the Apostle Paul again writes in 1 Timothy 1, uh, 8 through 11, I'm not sure I have all these verses in your uh, notes there, but please note that. Look it up later. Uh, Paul mentioned and applied uh, commandments 5 through 9. Okay? In this letter to Timothy, he speaks of, refers to commandments 5 through 9. So the second table of, of, of the, the two tablets of the law, and he, he does the commandments 5 through 9. And when he comes to the seventh commandment, he uses two key words. So this is like Paul on the seventh commandment, okay? Two key words. Uh, the first word he uses is the same word that Jesus 
use. So he takes his master's words and he uses that, referring to all sexual immorality. But listen to this second word that he placed um, under the seventh commandment. The English translates it homosexuality. Uh, this, this Greek word is fascinating. Paul seems to have coined this phrase. Like, this is original. This is like the first time in Greek literature. And it literally describes a man laying with a man as with a woman. Couldn't get more clearer. This means that according to the Bible, that seventh commandment also prohibits the practice of homosexuality as a sin. Now, church, let me pause here and say that all Christians must confess what the Bible confesses about our sexual sin. Okay, hear that. We, we must confess what the Bible confesses about our sexual sin. We must speak the truth in love. No matter how unpopular, no matter how uncomfortable, you got to agree with Jesus. Speak the truth in love. And don't affirm someone in that sin. See, this is important, church. The moment we stop confessing what the Bible clearly calls sin as sin is the moment we cease to, uh, to we stop moving with the Holy Spirit. It, it's in that moment that we stop following with Jesus. You, you see what I'm saying? And, and while we're not going to shrink back from confessing sin as sin and confessing Christ as Savior, let's not make this or any issue a particular kind of axe to grind and always circle back to it. No, we don't have to do that. However, and here's what I want you to know. We need to be very, very careful not to unintentionally cut people off from the gospel when you confirm them in their unrepentance by approving what God calls sin. You're cutting them off from the gospel. You're cutting them off from repentance. And, and you know what? My fear is that things are going to become harder. Harder for us, harder for our children, the next generation, this, as society continues to promote every kind of heart adultery. But may we ask God to help us to keep confessing our own sin, keep speaking tough truths with his tender love, keep proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, because that's the only hope for salvation. And we never want to cut anyone off from that or do anything to prevent them from coming to Jesus. So here, here's the point before we move forward in, in the second heading. Jesus and the New Testament says that the seventh commandment is not just about being against adultery, but against all sexual sin which has its source in every sinful human heart of every man, of every woman. It's heart adultery. Back to what Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, returning to verse 29 here, kind of wrap up that. Jesus gives help. He, he gives us uh, two steps to take when it comes to adultery of the heart. Jesus called us to take one, drastic measures, and two, he explains what's at stake here in this heart adultery. Okay, let's pay attention to that now. Uh, first, drastic measures. Uh, the drastic measures that we must take to avoid uh, violating the seventh commandment. Okay, first, Jesus said, tear it out, throw it away, or cut it off, and throw it away. Now, Jesus is not calling for bodily mutilation. Um, we know this because a person who can't see can still lust, can still commit adultery. This, this exaggerated or hyperbolic language makes a graphic point. Take drastic measures. When it comes to this kind of sin, take drastic measures. I, I've used this illustration in the past with um, our students. Uh, maybe I've shared it here too, but I, I had a Christian friend um, move in as my roommate in Kauai. And I come home one day, and the door of his room is missing. He unscrewed the door off the frame, and he put it in a closet. And I was pretty mad. <laughs> Like, really mad. Like, Sixth Commandment kind. And, and I asked him, like, what are you doing 
This is not your house. You can't just like take doors off, off the wall. And he told me he was having trouble with what he was doing on the internet behind closed doors. And he understood what Jesus said, and so he took his door off. Now, of course, he should have asked me first, but it was my place. But I had to admire his effort to do what Jesus said, to take drastic measures against your sin. What might you need to do today, right after this? What do you need to tear out, cut off, throw away? In order to throw away, tear out, cut off sexual sin and temptation and adultery. What do you need to do? Pray. Seek out biblical wisdom. Seek out godly counsel. Make a decisive move. That's what Jesus is saying. All right, second. Jesus pointed to what is at stake in this fight. And I think he does that so we would be motivated to take drastic measures. Notice where this lust, unchecked, uncut off, undealt with, leads to. He says it twice, right? It leads to your whole body into hell. Sounds very serious. What does Jesus mean? You know, set aside the hell on earth that sexual sin brings to our marriages, friendships, families, churches, society, even to your physical and spiritual health in the here and now. Set that aside for a moment. That's not what Jesus is necessarily referring to. What is he talking about? The terrifying warning Jesus issued is that this kind of sin tends to consume us, tends to take us over, to suck into it the totality of who we are, like a black hole, right? We fantasize about this sin, then we hide with it, we think we can safely compartmentalize it with no ill effect. We begin to live as functional atheists, thinking that God's absent when I'm indulging in this. And step by step, we're sucked deeper and deeper into living apart from God. And this doesn't stop permanently. See, the essence of lust and adultery are the same. That's what Jesus is getting at. And they lead to that unrepentant place. So the seventh commandment calls us to stand against adultery, all sexual impurity, but from what Jesus says, something more radical must happen. It's not just about correcting behavior. It comes down to the very core to your heart, to my heart. Okay, with this last heading, let's, let's think positively, helpfully. What, what can we do? What does God call us to do about all this? I'm not going to have time to go into depth in to all of this, but I want to give you four uh, quick fire kind of takeaways. It, it's in your notes. Um, so even if you don't have your notes now, grab one on the way out. Okay, four takeaways in no particular order. What does God call us to do then? Number one, pursue purity. Pursue purity. It's not just about being against adultery. Pursue purity. Purity that honors God. Purity in marriage. Listen to Hebrews 13, 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Purity in marriage. Second, purity in singleness. Okay, the, the apostle uh, speaks in, in the context in, in 1 Corinthians 7, to those God has called to singleness, to devote themselves to a season of singleness. And, and he says the purpose is to promote good order and, listen, to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. That's purity. Undivided devotion. Third, purity as a church. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I'll give you another one for the purity of the church, Ephesians 5, 3, and this is in the NIV. I already referred to this one. But among you, there must not be even a hint 
of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Church, may we seek to do honors God according to his word, especially in regards to sexuality, but also in all of life. Okay, that's number one, pursue purity. Number two, flee from sexual sin. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, when it comes to sexual sin, the Bible doesn't always say fight, battle, you know, resist. No, it, it actually tells us to run, flee from it, run away. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, straightforward, flee from sexual immorality. But implied in this, right, when you're fleeing from that, you need to run towards something else. And so, too, in the Bible, that's what it says. First, run from sexual, sexual sin, but second, run to God. Okay, this is, the, this is the second takeaway. Run from sexual sin, run to God. Um, James chapter 4, verses 7 to 10, I find very helpful in this. Listen to what um, he says, and I'm not going to pick through the whole passage, but first, James tells us, submit. Okay, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That word means give up, surrender. God, I'm done. I can't do this on my own. I need you. That's the first step. Submit to God. Second, resist. Resist. Resist the devil. So after you submit to God, I, I give up. I need you. Then you fight. You fight against temptation. You go to battle. You pray against the enemy and his works and his effects. Third, then you draw near. Right? Draw near to God. James 4, 8. You know, you come to God in prayer. You come to Him singing. When you're tempted, sing. Sing out to God. Come to Him in His Word. Maybe you've, you've gotten to the habit of storing Scripture in your, in your heart and in your mind. That's helpful. That's battle right there. Okay, fourth, James says, even if you stumble, repent at that heart level. Uh, listen to verse 8. I'll read more of it. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. When you stumble, be broken. Don't be callous. Mourn, weep. Ask God to help you mourn. Ask God to break you over your sin. Finally, fifth, James says to cling to the promises of God. Okay? These are the promises for those who run to Jesus. Look at what he says. I'm, I'm just going to kind of pull these from this passage. First, the devil will flee from you, verse 8. God will draw near to you, verse 8. He will exalt you, verse 10. You hear all the wills? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourself, and he will exalt you. Cling to that. Hold to that promise. Um, this week, my brother-in-law pointed me to an older hymn that takes its title from James chapter 4, uh, verse 6. And it's, it's titled, He Giveth More Grace. I, I don't know how the actual hymn goes. <laughs> I wouldn't sing it for you anyway, but here it is. He, here Christ's promise okay, to those who are in him. I just want to read it. It's in your notes. He giveth more grace as our burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as our labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. Fear not that thy need shall exceed his provision. Our God ever yearns his resources to share. Lean hard on the arm everlasting availing. The Father both thee and thy load will upbear. Last verse. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Amen? Flee from sin, run to Jesus, he giveth more grace. Praise God. Number three, trust in Jesus. And what I mean by that is live in the gospel of Jesus. I think of Romans 6, 
on this point, and, and again, look this up in your own time. Romans 6, verses 12 to 14 reminds the Christian that not only did Christ die for your sin, but by your union with him, through faith, you also died to sin with him. He didn't just die for your sin, you died to sin with him. And that has massive implications. Therefore, sin's not your master anymore. Okay, you don't need to listen to it. Okay, that's, that's a lie. You don't have to listen to it. And you were also raised with him in your union with him. So you can refuse to obey that old master, sin, and you can get to work serving your new master, Christ, and you can hold on to the precious promise at the end of Romans 6.14, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under the law as a covenant of works, but you're under grace. It will not have dominion over you. That's a promise. So live in that gospel. Remind yourself, I died with Christ. I don't have to listen to sin anymore. Let's get going serving Jesus. Because this is not going to have dominion over me. All right, last one. Pursue healthy marriage. What that means is to see the beauty of what God is trying to protect here. What what God has made. Why he gives us this law to protect it. Um, This will be a, a quick flyover. One pastor described this biblical vision for a healthy marriage in five C's, okay? Complementarity. Husband and wife uh, were created different, different roles, but as a team, they glorify God. Okay, they, they enjoy one another. There's, there's a friendship there that can be enjoyed in that complementarity than none other. There's a love, even a sexual kind of love that can be enjoyed there than in none other relationship. God means for marriage to be the gr- one of the great antidotes to this sexual plague that we face. Okay, so complementarity. Um, next two C's, covenant and children. Uh, Malachi 2, verses 13 to 16. Uh, look at that later. But the prophet Malachi says something really interesting. He says that the Lord's the one who unites man and wife in a covenant. So he's there helping them, making this covenant. And it's through that godly covenant marriage that he intends to raise up godly generations. That's God's beautiful vision for marriage. Pursue that. Pursue covenant faithfulness. Pursue raising up godly generations in marriage. Okay, last two C's, Christ and the church. When you think about um, marriage and the gospel, you have to go to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25 and 31 to 32. Again, I'm not going to read it all, but it describes a relationship between Jesus and the church as the paradigm for this relationship between husband and wife. And the mystery of this all, the beauty of this all, is God designed marriage so that the gospel could be symbolized in a beautiful, in a powerful way. Think about it. It's not like God made marriage, then sent his son, and said, oh, that's cool. I can teach people about Jesus through marriage. No. The mystery that Paul's pointing to is that the reason why marriage even exists in the first place why it was invented by God is that it's an expression in time of the gospel, which God planned before the foundation of the world. So marriage at its finest, church, points to the goodness of God in Christ who lays down his life like a husband for his wife and the church who submits to trust in Christ as a wife for her husband. All right, so let me sum that up. The seventh commandment just underscores God's glorious vision for marriage. Make that your vision. That's what you want to pursue. Pursue healthy marriage. By the grace of God, seek to be a team. By the grace of God, seek to be one. By the grace of God, raise up that next godly generation that the glory of God in Christ may be put on full display over all the earth. Okay, let's close here. As we close today, when we talk about adultery, hard adultery, sometimes the enemy 
tries to flood you with guilt, right? Maybe he brings up the past, tries to overwhelm you with discouragement because you see the standard, the holy, pure standard of God, and you realize, I fall short, and so the enemy just tries to throw it in your face. I want you to know that all true believers struggle sometimes, and we struggle in this way. Uh, Even the great reformer Martin Luther, remember him again? He struggled greatly. Um, He battled even through bouts of depression with his sin. He was so broken at how how much he struggled. But he learned to cling to Christ, right? Remember, Simmel used to say, Peccator, listen to what he wrote. This This is Luther to a T. He said this, and this is in your notes. So when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this. I admit that I deserve death and hell, what of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also. Amen? You remember what Jesus said about the woman who washed his feet in Luke 7? Remember she was known over all the city? as a sinner, in that context that usually meant something like a, like a prostitute or like someone who was loose. It says that she fell upon Jesus' feet. It says that she wept. It says that she poured perfume on his feet and took her hair and wiped his feet with her hair. And then this Pharisee, seeing something like this, he recoils with disgust. And what did Jesus say? Luke 7, 47, 48, Therefore I tell you, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. May may you hear that word of grace today and come to Jesus. Close with this final quote. T.H. Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He said this, you are a great sinner. But he is a greater Savior. Come, Goliath, sinner, the Son of God, the Son of David, can save even you. Amen? Let's pray. Please stand if you're able. Join me in prayer, church. Let's pray. Father, Father in heaven, forgive us. We confess that we have failed you a thousand times over a thousand. We repent today of our heart adultery, our lust, our failure to love our spouses to be faithful to them, our failure to love others in purity. For King David, we pray against you and you only have we sinned. God, we thank you that Jesus Christ has triumphed over our sin, over Satan, even over death itself. And that though our sin is many, His mercy is more. Holy Spirit, create in us clean hearts. Renew in us right spirits. Holy God, purify our hearts that we may seek only You. Only You. Only Your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.